along with us for your uh, uh, intensity in making this happen. And uh, look forward to working with, uh, with CAMP as we uh, make it easier for entrepreneurs to be on their journeys without too much of uh, um, distraction, so to speak. Uh, uh, Sanjay, uh, you know, thank you again from, uh, uh, from on behalf of the board, you being uh, here and providing the perspective uh, uh, from a tie angle. Uh, essentially, when I heard, uh, you know, having been an entrepreneur for 20 years, when I spoke to Rukmini and Gayatri, uh, while I had heard of mediation, I had not realized that there is such a structured process and an entity that is driving this process for entrepreneurs. And as I look back on my own journey, uh, I was able to think and, and reflect saying that, listen, maybe there were seven or eight instances in my own entrepreneurial journey where a mediation process like this could have really made a difference to our journeys uh, as an entrepreneur. You know, uh, you know, just to share, there was a there was a fallout in the early days with another uh, founder, and I went through a six month protracted process trying to get him to give up a part of the shares that uh, we had allocated to him naively, thinking that hey, everything will be hunky dory. Uh, fortunately, it, res it, re it got resolved in the right way. If I hadn't, Meritrack wouldn't have meet fo moved forward. And similarly, so on and so forth with employees, with partners, with, with investors, there was always uh, some flare up or the other, uh, which requires, uh, which, which would have been better uh, if there was an external uh, party helping us resolve differences. And that is the value I saw uh, in this partnership that we as entrepreneurs, when we uh, when we rush into things, when when a lot of things happen beyond our control, uh, and we really had to sit across the table and figure out how to make things work, uh, having somebody like uh, experts like the folks at CAM would make a huge difference. And I saw that as a huge value that we can add to our entrepreneurial network. Uh, and hence, um, you know, that's where we are with this partnership. Uh, I would... Uh, you know, this is obviously will be the first of many conversations we'll have. Uh, and I really look forward to uh, hearing and and witnessing success stories that we can see from this process, where I'm sure uh, all of you as entrepreneurs, uh, once you understand how this works, uh, I'm very confident that they'll be hugely beneficial uh, to all of our journeys as entrepreneurs. Uh, so I look forward to working with all of you uh, at CAMP and making sure that we are able to get the benefit of the service and uh, to all of our members and make sure that we are able to communicate and convey the service in the right uh, possible uh, way and uh, present it to our entrepreneurs. And hopefully the world will be a much better, less uh, fictitious uh, world for entrepreneurs to carry on their business uh, and to uh, kind of play to their strengths and purposes rather than uh, you know, spending time otherwise. Uh, so I wish this initiative all the best. Uh, look forward to staying engaged. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure, uh, Gayatri Rukmini, I'm going to come to you with, you know, given the entrepreneurial journeys we have, I'm sure I'll be coming to you for your services in the next uh, few months myself. Thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Madan. Thank you. Vinay, can you please uh, play the video? Yeah, Shreya, just a second before Vinay, please. Just wanted to thank Madan and say that for us in CAMP, uh, you know, we are, we are really thrilled about partnering with Thai because, um, you know, what better way to bring innovation in conflict resolution or dispute resolution system than with a startup enabler like Thai. So thank you for the opportunity and we'll sort of discuss further later. Thank you, Gayatri. Thank you, Vinay. Sanjay, request you to please take over from here.
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. Thanks, Madan. That was a very, very nice, warm, uh, and I think a very uh, proud moment for all of us here at Thai Bangalore as we announced the launch of the Thai Bangalore and Camp uh, Mediation Desk. So welcome all, welcome to all the participants. And uh, it's now 12 past four. So uh, what I will do now by way of uh, setting the uh, stage for the rest of uh, the session is I'm very quickly going to introduce the panelists. And thereafter, we're gonna jump straight into a conversation with them. Uh, we have decided to keep this very conversational and interactive. So please share all your questions, your comments, et cetera, in the uh, chat box at the bottom. Uh, we will pick them up and respond to them and make sure that uh, each one of your uh, questions and comments are responded to. Um, so with that, uh, let me just uh, jump into the uh, session proper. So we have with us um, Gayatri Kalia, who is the executive director of CAMP. And CAMP, uh, by the way, for those who still aren't aware of its uh, expansion stands for Center for Arbitration and Mediation Practice. Um, Gayatri is a former civil servant with a significant impact on the country's public policy an internationally certified and practicing mediator and paneled also with the Singapore International Mediation Institute. Then we have, so welcome Gayatri. Then we have Rukmani Menon, who's the director with CAMP. She's a lawyer with over 30 years of experience in indirect tax laws and an internationally trained and certified mediator. She's impaneled with the UNDP Global Panel, NCLT, and the National Consumer Forum. Uh, we have Abhishek Lakshmi Narayan, Abhi, who is an investor and the former chief investment officer from Catamaran Ventures. So he will bring the perspective of the investor and what kinds of issues they see in the companies that they invest in and uh, their, the relationship between an investor and an entrepreneur is not always um, rosy and hunky-dory. Finally, we have uh, uh, Vikas Mahendra, was a partner with Keystone Advocates and Solicitors, co-founder for the Center for Online Disputes and Resolution. Detailed profiles are available. We can all uh, look to them in due course. Um, so let me warmly welcome all of my panelists this afternoon. Thank you. So let me jump, jump straight into this. Um, you know, we've all heard of these phrases, mediation, arbitration, and all of that, um, and there's, a fair bit of fuzziness with regard to these terms. Um, so uh, Rukmini, if you can uh, talk to us about uh, what exactly is mediation and then Gayatri, you can tell us about uh, arbitration and how the two really differ and why should one consider you know, either of them or both of them. Over to you, Rukmini. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanjay. And so glad to be here today evening. Uh, thank you to all the participants. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, conversation, uh, you know, start up by Mr. Madan, where he said, if he had known about this process a couple of years back, he would have definitely, you know, used it. So before I get to what exactly is mediation, I'd just like to mention that any business, be it startup or otherwise, conflict disputes are inevitable. But it's how you resolve these conflicts. Do you want to get into protracted court battles? Do you want to get into long drawn arbitration? Sometimes these are inevitable, there's no doubt about it. But as a matter of course, for every dispute, every conflict, is it necessary? And having been a litigating lawyer for so long, I know what it takes, what stress it creates, how it damages business relationships. So now what is this? What, what exactly are we talking about when we say mediation? Mediation is a facilitated negotiation where a mediator as a neutral assists the parties in resolving their disputes, any kind of dispute on their terms and conditions in a very uh, you know, safe, and friendly uh, environment, unlike a court uh, setup. So this, the, out, the most important part of a mediation process is that the outcome is in the hand, 
hands of the parties. They decide how their uh, conflict is going to be resolved. So party-centric process, the parties are the center of this. It's a confidential process. Whatever happens in a mediation stays there. It is a voluntary process. Nobody can force uh, you know, anybody, uh, either of the parties to come in for mediation, only if they want to. And the best part of it, after going through a couple of sessions, if they do not want to continue, they can come out of mediation. <clears throat> mediation is, as I already mentioned, the end, end of end, the res resolution in mediation is in the hands of the parties, not unlike a court process, a judge decides. Here, the parties decide. The mediator is a neutral. The mediator is, you know, a part, a person who only assists the parties, not giving any legal advice to either of the two parties. Um, uh, court, uh, I mean, it's it's a very common factor that uh, court processes are long drawn and could take up to ten years. Mediation, to the contrary, we have uh, disputes being resolved at camp, maybe within you know, a couple of hours, the maximum it takes is about six months. And so it becomes a very cost effective and a time effective process for parties to resolve their disputes as compared to the other modes of dispute resolution. Moreover, it's final, the resolution reads since it is, you know, the terms and conditions are decided by the parties and the settlement agreement is based on these terms and conditions. So at the end of the day, this is a final and binding agreement. There's no appeal, unlike in a court process or sometimes even an arbitral award gets challenged. So this process at the end of the day is, is goes a long way in sustaining business relationships. So it is for the building of businesses because as, the, as, as is a very famous quote, the business of business is business and not litigation. So with that, I hope uh, everybody has got a hang on what exactly this process is about. And I hand it over to uh, my colleague, Gayatri. Thank you. Gayatri? Yeah. So that was uh, great, uh, Rukmani, for providing us context about what uh, mediation is and what the processes are. Over to you, Gayatri, to Thank walk you. us through arbitration and how it's distinct. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say some elements of what I'd say about arbitration applies to litigation as well. Although some aspects of my arbitration uh, thoughts because my dispute later on. Uh, so we'll give a chance for him to dispute at a different, at a, in a different level. See, uh, see, both arbitration mediation, if I were to put it in monetary terms, uh, if you were to earn, uh, uh, you know, a year's uh, salary, a year's earnings, you spend 10 years earnings in litigation, and maybe you you spend about five years or three to four years earnings in arbitration. And if you're smart, you choose mediation because you will spend maybe one week's earnings in uh, mediation, right? And that's also not taking the time cost of money. Uh, so the, this is a very critical difference if you're an entrepreneur already struggling to make ends meet or getting the maximum for your buck. The other important thing is the fact that entrepreneurial relationships are a little bit like marriage in the initial stages. Every vendor, every person who gives your first order, your investor, your people around you are people who are invested with you emotionally and you're invested in them emotionally. So it's not a cut and dry transactional process. Uh, so that complexity of that emotional element is best dealt with in mediation. Arbitration and litigation does not provide for that. It in fact looks at emotion as coming in the way of what is purely a business relationship which is never so. There's nothing which is purely business. Everything in life or every conflict has emotion underlying it. And the third important thing which applies both to arbitration and litigation, that arbitration less so is that in mediation, it's very customer centric, the process. You want it in the evening, you want it in the late night, you want it with people in different time zones. Uh, you want it done in your house because you're paralytic or you have a problem. Mediation accommodates it easily because it's a philosophy of mediation to customize the process for the people. You don't ask the people to uh, adjust themselves to the process. So I want to stop with these three very critical um, uh, aspects of why one would, how one would look at mediation. 
vis-a-vis -vis arbitration and litigation. And during the course, I'm sure we'll learn a bit more. Great. So I, I'll come back to you, Gayatri, so that you can walk us through the distinction between mediation and arbitration, right? Uh, meanwhile, what we'll do is, um, let me call out to Vinay. We're going to conduct a small poll here. Uh, and all of you participants are expected to please participate. And over to you, Vinay, to give us the highlights of this mediation desk type poll. Yeah. So we have a one-minute poll. Uh, you would see it on your screen. We have another 30 seconds. So these are simple yes, no questions. And one question on a scale of one to 10. Yeah, final 10 seconds. Done? Yeah, I see 52% have participated. Yeah, 55. So uh, here are the results. Let me just share the results as well. Yeah, over to you, Sanjay. Yeah, so the results are visible to all of you. Um, and I don't want to read it out. I'm sure you can all see it. Yeah. Am I right? Okay. Is that visible to everybody? Yes. Excellent. Okay. And uh, so as you can see, uh, about 100% had heard of mediation. And is there a fourth question, Vinay? There are four questions, yes. Uh, so if you can scroll, because I'm not able to see the fourth yeah. the responses to the fourth question. Yeah, the fourth question is, uh, did you know that mediation was used to resolve the dispute between the Ambani brothers? 63% uh, say yes. Okay. And 37% uh, they aren't aware of mediation being used to that. Excellent. So I think we are in... Uh, we have a good set of participants where there's familiarity with the terms, which means that we now can get into the details about and the nuances of what they actually are and how the whole process really works in practice. Thanks, uh, thanks, Vinay. So coming back to you, Gayatri, now you can just walk us through the distinction between arbitration and mediation, and then over to Vikas, who will talk to us about the legal issue or the legal standing of both of these. Over to you, guys. Yeah, so like I said, you have cost a very important aspect. You have the time saved, the opportunity cost of time is a very important aspect. You have the flex flexibility and ease of process as a very important aspect. Uh, and, and the fourth very important element is what uh, uh, Rupani touched upon is that self-determination, party autonomy. So there's no judge sitting on top of you and deciding what is right for you. Uh, sometimes, and we have uh, had many times it happens in where the parties are uh, fighting against a government or even an employee of government is fighting against government. You get a decision in your favor, which itself you're completely unhappy with. I've had uh, as an officer to go to court and have the judge tell me to do things which I thought were completely impractical and non-feasible. It would have been much better for the case to have not gone to court at all. Uh, so you, you do get a judgment in your favor, but the judgment is actually not in your favor. It's more of a pain. It's a, it is like the remedy being worse than the disease. So you don't have that kind of a situation. Uh, and something like that could happen in arbitration as well, because a third part, you give the power to decide what is best for you to a third party. Uh, so there's somebody sitting on judgment. Um, so, but in cultures, in sometimes in groups of people, that may be what they want. But if you want to take the power of decision of what is best for you in your hands, then mediation it is. So I'll ask Vikas to step in here. Okay, thanks. Uh, over to you, Vikas. Um, uh, thanks, Ajay. Thanks, Gayatri. Uh, Firstly, I mean, I, I do both arbitration and mediation. So I, uh, you know, guys, may, may have mentioned that, you know, I might disagree with her on, on the preference of mediation to arbitration. Let me clarify that at the outset. I don't. 
And that despite the fact that a good bit of my revenue is from arbitration. But that does not mean that the remainder of the uh, dispute resolution processes are irrelevant. I think they're all complementary to each other. And my own personal belief is that, you know, uh, un unless you have a viable arbitration or a litigation set up, you can't really go into mediation because otherwise there's no real threat to because, you know, we've, we've looked at people where they want to settle the dispute, but they know litigation and arbitration is going to take years on end. So they don't even want to engage in mediation. So these are not things that work in silos. They, I think, work and complement each other. But certainly from a cost benefit analysis, there's no doubt that mediation is head and shoulders above anything else. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. And that goes into the actual question I need to answer, which is the enforceability of these things. So far as a litigation or a court judgment is concerned, people know that it's enforceable. Right. But what people may not know is that to enforce a court judgment, you might actually take about four or five years, sometimes more. So even if you have a decision that is in your favor, which says you are correct, you are entitled to X amount of money till the time you get that money in your bank account or your wallet might be a long, long journey. So that is something that you need to be acutely aware of with court litigation and to some extent with arbitration as well. With court litigation, more so because any judgment you get is subject to appeal, which means that, you know, you're in that entire decision making process over and over again, sometimes two or three rounds of it. With arbitration, it's a little less so, but even there, there are grounds in which you can challenge it, which means firstly, whether you've actually won is decided in one round of litigation, then you need to get you know, that gets challenged and gets settled once more and then the enforcement. So each of them is a really time consuming process. Not until then would you actually get money in your pocket. That's a big difference between them. The other thing in terms of mediation is, you know, you, you say, okay, fine, mediation and arbitration and litigation are difficult to enforce. What about mediation? Most often, if you have good counsel, if you have good representation, you will make the mediation award or mediation settlement self-executing. So you will try and avoid another round of litigation to enforce a mediation settlement. How do you achieve that? You can achieve that through a number of different ways, escrow arrangements, post data checks, whatever. There's, there's a whole host of ways of doing that. But even if you want to enforce it, there are ways and means of doing it, not maybe as robust as litigation and arbitration, or maybe sometimes more, but slightly differently. So if you're in a mediation, as things stand today, for you to get it legally enforced, you will have to get it converted into what's called a conciliation award. Now, that's a slightly technical language of saying it's not enough that you two agree and a mediator has signed. You need to convert that into a format which the Arbitration Conciliation Act recognizes as being enforceable. If that happens, you can take that settlement agreement to court and without the other party being present, you can tell the court to attach that person's property or auction it and get your money's worth. So it's very immediately directly enforceable. A mediation settlement as of today is not self-executed. So you will need to do this step of conciliation award to get that enforced. And to give you a very practical insight, I have tried to challenge a conciliation award. Don't ask me why it's a complex story. It's ridiculously difficult, right? Arbitration awards, you know, there is enough number of cases where arbitration awards have been challenged successfully. So, but I haven't been able to find a single instance where a conciliation settlement has been challenged. So that just shows you the binding nature of it. If it is recorded in the correct format in the future, hopefully not in the distant future, mediation settlements will be automatically enforceable. And that is what is coming by way of the mediation bill, which is being deliberated in the parliament as we speak. And if that comes in, much like an arbitration or a court litigation decision, even a mediation agreement will be self-enforced. So that's sort of the range of the various things. All in all, like I said, if you make mediation self-executing, which a good competent lawyer will be able to assist you with and guide you with, a good mediator will be able to guide you with, then you will avoid the entire process of court litigation and save, like, like, like Gatsu was saying, 10 years worth of your earnings or, or a little lesser than that. So yeah, that, that's uh, my two cents on that. So I think it's important for people to start saving up some of their earnings if they decide to go down the path of arbitration, right? <laughs> okay, um, Abhi, your turn. Uh, you know, you've invested in several businesses. I'm sure you've had more than your fair share of experience of dealing with uh, disputes and all kinds of conflicts vis-a-vis -vis entrepreneurs, the board, all of those things. Uh, just help us understand um, 
what you see as the reason for businesses to consider mediation or arbitration. And, and if you can just throw in a couple of examples, that would be helpful. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. I think um, the way Gayatri described the value proposition is quite uh, clear. Uh, for, for an entrepreneur, the, the most important resources continue to be time and capital. So I think that's the reason that screams out most. Um, and I think the other one that Madan said that, you know, as he reflected back on his entrepreneurial career, he would have had seven or eight times where he had the ability to, to resolve a conflict or a dispute faster. I think here, you know, um, for me, the way we've been seeing our startup ecosystem evolve, the breakneck speed, it's very apparent how public and costly uh, disputes are now becoming. And it's quite unfortunate that it's not only the dispute that gets public, it's really just um, stakeholder value that gets destroyed across its relationships, its employees, its fellow entrepreneurs. Um, so I feel it's it's so, so important to have, um, you know, like, I, like Rukmani said, conflicts are unavoidable, but have mediation as the go-to option for, for dispute resolution. And, I've, and I, as I reflect on my, my career as an investor, I almost feel I, I, I was a mediator in most of those conversations at the board. You know, effectively, that's what an, a good board member does. They, they mediate conflict. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's super, super important that entrepreneurs recognize that conflicts are going to arise, but have the mechanisms in place early on. And I, I'd always say before, before the conflict in the honeymoon period, I always suggest entrepreneurs have mediation clauses in your term sheets. You know, everything's hunky-dory when you get into a relationship. So start thinking about how you'll, how you'll address conflict at that point in time. Um, so I, I just, uh, you know, time, cost, reputation, confidentiality are some of the screaming reasons that our ecosystem needs to now adopt mediation. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Abhi. You know, most of the term sheets or shareholder uh, agreements that I've been part of for the last 30 years, uh, they don't actually talk about mediation or arbitration. There's always a high court jurisdiction that is laid out. So perhaps it's time to amend some of those agreements to include these mediation and arbitration clauses. Um, so now, uh, you know, Gayatri, there's always this issue about, you know, mediation sounds too good to be true. Um, you know, and I'm sure there are different kinds of conflicts um, which are amenable to mediation. And I'm sure there are conflicts that aren't so amenable. If you can help us understand that, it will be very helpful for our audience. So uh, in my view, actually, anything and everything is mediatable. Uh, uh, unless, of course, it's a case where uh, you have murdered somebody or committed a heinous crime, uh, which is uh, like against society or you know public conscience or social conscience. Uh, but uh, and if you look at it from a commercial perspective, all company matters. In fact, sensitive board level conflicts or CXO conflicts or conflicts where your reputation, you do not want it to damage, get damaged. Um, very importantly, uh, you know, I'd like to highlight even before it becomes a conflict, there, there is a latent or a simmering grievance. And uh, you, you sort of hear about it in the grapevine, you know, as an HR head or a, um, a you know, business uh, vertical head, but you're not addressing it. You feel that it would sort of settle down. It's perhaps gossip and all of that. And Actually, mediation comes in very, it's extremely useful in such cases. So it could be of, say, simmering discrimination uh, or perceived discrimination. For example, in workplaces where we now have uh, several generational or uh, culturally and, uh, and socially generational differences. You have people coming from, uh, uh, you know, uh, rural areas, coming into cities, taking up jobs, and they have a different kind of cultural orientation. And you have you know, three generation, four generation of urban people in the same office, different cultural orientation. Now, there are conflicts and perceptions of discrimination that arise. So mediation becomes actually a very safe harbor for people to come and discuss this without necessarily feeling that they are formally complaining. And what would that complaint do to them? So all company matters, all commercial matters, all breach of contract um, matters, all matters which have yet to blow up into a conflict, all intellectual property disputes, and all family matters. Because after all, entrepreneurs are human beings too. So we have conflicts within our own families, maybe our marriages with our siblings. All family matters are subject to um, mediation as of today. 
in the mediation bill some exceptions are envisaged but uh, you know those exceptions uh, some of them we feel are not uh, should not be exceptions because they are actually mediated today so we won't go very deep into it but one thing i want to highlight in fact government has put itself uh, in, in saying that they would mediate commercial cases that was setting the precedent for uh, adopting mediation and walking the talk i'll just stop here you know in, in, it's often said in india that negotiations begin after an agreement is signed uh, so in the case of uh, mediation right i'm sure you know, folks agree and generally because it's built in an in an atmosphere of trust and good faith and and all of that unlike let's say a legal situation where there's you know almost an antagonistic view uh, have there been situations or under what circumstances uh, rukmini do you see or have you seen mediated settlements not work let's say people are all very well quite happy they sign up and then something goes wrong right i mean how does one prevent that and what are the situations that lead to that um very very interesting question sanjay now coming back to frankly speaking in my experience at camp uh, having uh, am i audible yes you are okay uh, now i was just talking about my experience at camp see um, there have been no uh, disputes uh, which we have mediated uh, we Uh, done a lot of different types of uh, mediations there have been none so far since 2015 when we started where having reached an agreement the parties have stepped back and not adhered to the terms and conditions and the main reason for that sanjay being that the parties themselves have reached these terms and conditions nobody has imposed these terms and conditions on them so since it is a uh, process of self determination am i audible yes you are please carry on yeah look when you may want to switch I know off the video there seems to be some problem with my wifi yeah. no we can yeah, hear you i think i'll switch off my video yeah. we can hear you look when yeah yeah so exactly so i i coming back to what i was saying I'll just no. step in for a minute while the things with the yeah. mediator ah. come to determine these things. Pardon? No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The parties, after a lot of uh, you know a deliberation, reach these terms and conditions. So there are uh, hardly any any. Uh, we have no cases where the parties have not adhered to the terms and conditions. But if it be so. then as vikas said uh, there are um, uh, settlements are made into conciliators award and these conciliators awards are oh, we might have to mediate with the network connection yeah no uh, i'll just take on from here and then vikas can also step in uh the uh, like when you were saying today there is when you convert it to an award that the court looks at it very seriously if you do not if you well shot it the mediation bill in fact looks at it very seriously and gives very very rare grounds for you to go and not abide by an award so uh, that is a, a, a that is the but having said that there are times when mediation award entered into with the best of intention also fails uh one of the reasons is uh, also the skill with which a mediator has enabled that mediation process uh and like vikas said the skill which with the councils have reality tested it and enabled the parties to look at whether they can actually abide by it in reality and number 3 is even with all of that somebody might go and change their mind and say that okay this doesn't work for me or i should have done better because there are so many stakeholders in the system who might challenge them. and if that happens then it does go back to litigation so it's not a panacea that 100% it would work but we have seen like uh, rukmani also said in camp that people have gone back have settled have welched on it somebody has gone then they have stayed on for 8 months 10 months 12 months 3 years 
and got the reality of the litigation system have come back, not necessarily to camp on, given themselves to accept and work on a mediation agreement. So sometimes we say that, um, you know, the, the reality of litigation needs to hit people before the wisdom of mediation kicks in. Got it. Thanks. Thanks, Gayatri. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to add uh, just one thing to what Gayatri said. So, uh, uh, the you know, it's very interesting that uh, you should, parties should get, there's a right time to come in for mediation. You know, following, because uh, parties don't, at the onset of a dispute part, some parties do not understand what it is going to be like in a litigation. What, what are they faced with? So sometimes when they come in for mediation and they just refuse to sort of, uh, you know, budge from their positions. So as mediators, we tell them, try, try your options, but our doors are always open to you. And 99.9% .9 parties have come back after three, four, five, as Gayatri mentioned, saying, oh my God, not, not the long run process. We rather go by this. Got so it. I just wanted to add that. No, great. Thank you. So it seems to me that mediation is obviously a very um, safe, friendly, uh, trusting environment within which, let's say, uh, an agreement or a settlement is arrived at. Now, in this kind of a settlement, if somebody walks in and says, trust me, I'm a lawyer, that might not be entirely uh, a happy situation for people. So because I'm kind of pulling your leg when I'm saying this. But uh, just the reality of the situation, you know, when a lawyer, let's say, also decides to participate in a mediation discussion, is it somewhere somehow adding that element of excessive legalistic uh, component to what is otherwise a negotiated, friendly, happy, amiable settlement? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, lawyers are seen as being the, a source of... Uh, of sorrow rather than joy and the opposite of being a pleasurable, amicable settlement. And that's unfortunately the reputation they've built. But I think a properly trained or an experienced counsel can actually do the exact opposite. They can avoid heartache at a time when things go south. Because see, when there is a dispute between the parties, there are things, you know, things look ugly. But you have to remember that every dispute is preceded by a time when there was no dispute, when people thought that everything is amicable, everything is great. And I think that applies equally to a mediation scenario as well. Maybe at the point in time when you're trying to arrive at solutions, maybe at the point in time where you're deciding which solution to take, the party takes the lead. But I think a council most certainly comes in handy in a couple of reasons. One, to be a sounding board. Because in, in the mediation, you know, as important as it is that the discussions happen to the mediator with the other party, it's important to evaluate, self-reflect, and understand where you're going. And that, I think, is a conversation that happens during the breaks, during between sessions, which is when the lawyer actually plays the most important role, may not be in the mediation session. Even One during quick the question, session. because if I may interrupt you, one quick question. While the lawyer is, is part of all of this, who appoints the lawyer and who pays the lawyer? The parties pay for it. So the mediation, in the, in the mediation process, very quickly, there's the party, there's the party's representative, which is the lawyer. Then there's the mediator. The mediator is the neutral, which both parties together appoint, but each party's lawyer is appointed by that party itself. So the lawyer oh, okay. takes care of the interests of that party, which right. is why when I said be a sounding board, so it's so that the party comes out and says, you know, I'm not being cheated again. I'm not being taken for a ride again. Am I doing the right thing? It's that sort of assurance that the lawyer can bring to the table. That's one aspect. The second, and I think very, very important, is to draft a watertight settlement agreement. Because what is the worst thing that can happen is you've agreed to everything. You are under a certain impression as to what's going to happen, but the agreement doesn't reflect it. You know, three years down the line, the party becomes opportunistic and they say, you know what? I don't want to adhere to it. So you're then again back in the situation of conflict. So in a mediation, a, part, a, a good lawyer plays an excellent role of dispute avoidance in the future and ensuring a complete resolution of matters in the current dispute. Got it. So therefore, uh, my takeaway from what you just said is that it's always worthwhile to have a lawyer who's familiar with the mediation process, right? And is understands what mediation is and understands, therefore, that it, you need to reach a point of settlement that essentially, you know, can be uh, enforceable, right? 
uh, it's watertight, uh, you know, yeah. like you said. Yeah. And just okay. come in here, and something here. Yeah, go, yeah go please go ahead. go ahead, Rukmini. You know, uh, without uh, mediators, as I mentioned, and uh, everybody mentioned, mediators are neutral. So if you don't have parties come in with their councils, you know, as neutrals, we cannot be giving legal advice to either of the two parties. And it's very necessary that they. Uh, parties may not be sound about the legal aspects. Mediation is an informal, flexible process, but the, it is done under the shadow of law. So that's why it becomes extremely important that we have skilled counsels who know the process of mediation, assisting party, assisting their respective clients in the process. Mm -hmm. They need to coach parties uh, to you know tell them that you're not arguing against each other. We are not here in a win-lose, uh, not battling to win. A court, like in a court. Here we are sitting here to understand each other's perspectives so that, you know, we can uh, be in each other's go, uh, imagine in each other's shoes and we can come out with these options. So having a council there is of utmost importance. Just want yeah. to add that. Thank Got you. It. Thank you. I, I, Sanjay, one more addition, which is important, especially in the context of the cost question that you asked. One is that the, uh, the council enables the parties to understand the reality of the law far more clearly. So most of the time when we are uh, sort of, you know, full of the adrenaline of conflict and the rage of conflict, we always think that we are always right and what we have to get is uh, exaggerated. And what the other person has to pay uh, is also to the extreme. So a lawyer who is educated in mediation does the reality testing for the parties when you went. What really will happen out there in the courts uh, or in the litigation environment. So it's very critical for, from that perspective. Right. The second in perspective of the cost is that uh, your lawyer's cost, and if it's a good lawyer, he will accept mediation and refer mediation if the case is appropriate and the stage is appropriate, is actually you're cutting down your litigation cost by 90% future litigation costs with the lawyer. So even if you have a counsel and a mediator, you end up doing 90% savings in any kind of litigation. Got it. So, Got it. Okay. Because, you know, that, that opens up a set of other questions re relating to incentives, but I will park that for another day. Um, so a question now for, uh, you know, for you, Gayatri and uh, Rukmani, if you can jump in. Uh, help us understand what a mediation process actually is and what has been the process that you have employed at uh, CAMP. So if you can, if you can take some examples, that will help us understand the whole thing better. Okay. Gayatri? I'll start off with a case that recently came in. Uh, you know, we had, uh, we had a senior HR person of a multinational company call us and uh, uh, write, to, write to us and say that, that he, they actually reached out to one of our mediators and say that they had a, a workplace discrimination case between two departmental heads. Oh, no, a departmental head and an immediate reporting. And uh, when that happened, uh, we uh, sort of normally refer them to our case manager. Uh, some of the best practices in the world is to have a case manager who works on educating the person who seeks to resolve a conflict on what the process would be very transparently and upfront. And then the mediator steps in and the case manager helps to uh, handhold the scheduling, the logistics throughout the case management, as well as help the mediator in any research work that they would need. So the mediator transferred the case to the case manager who then had a conversation with this HR head. Now the HR head was not the disputing party. She, he or she was not part of the dispute itself, but wanted to adopt mediation and felt that as the, as the HR head or the HR system, they cannot provide the required neutrality to the dispute itself. So although they had the wherewithal, they said, we want somebody who's conceived and perceived as a neutral third party. So the case manager gets the basics of the case, uh, what the case is about, very essential elements who the disputing parties are. So if the third person calls like this, we call them the initiating party and not necessarily the um, uh, dispute, one of the disputing parties. And, they, and we explain to this person uh, what the process would be, that we would, have, uh, we would have to get the voluntary participation of the disputing parties. We will talk to both of them 
They have to voluntarily agree to be part of this. We'll find out whether they have any constraints or are there any preferences of language, culture. So if someone, let's say, is a French citizen and the other person is an Indian citizen, then we will see culturally are there requirements to be addressed in this dispute. So the cultural aspect, any other aspect, if it's emotionally very charged or is it a commercially complex case? So these are the elements that a case manager would uh, check and then provide, present the dispute resolution process that they would come on board, they would pay the fees, they would be given an option to look at the mediator list and choose the mediator they think is most suitable for the case. And in this, in this case, uh, a particular mediator was chosen, then when we show a list, they change their preference and, uh, and uh, actually chose a more costly, a more expensive mediator because they felt that the mediator would be the best fit for the case. And then we uh, talk to them about conflicts of interest, you know, the, whether, the, uh, whether we check with the mediator, the mediator has a conflict of interest that have they sort of played ball as a neighbor. Uh, you know, have they, we go back to their childhood actually, so that we do not want any perceived impartiality. And if there is a conflict of interest, we put it out uh, to the media, uh, to the people, and get a no conflict waiver. Uh, and then we get them on board from the mediator, comes on board and addresses, uh, tells them about, uh, engages with them about more important details of mediation, along with the lawyer, to design the mediation process. I'll stop here and hand over to Rukmani to sort of explain it a bit further. But if you, do you have any questions right now uh, or would you like Rukmani to go on? I, I just have one question, uh, Gayatri. Um, when one agrees to a mediation process and agrees to a mediator saying, yes, I'm comfortable with this mediator, is there a contract that's entered into between the parties and the mediator, A, and B, if I'm unhappy with some process, something in between, can that process be junked? And finally, if there is something at the end, let's say there's a settlement that's been reached, a handshake has been done. If at that point in time, I feel that there's been something that's been kept hidden from me in, while in the process of reaching that agreement, can one sue a mediator? Okay, all great questions. I'll ask Rukmani to come in here and then I will add if so there's something to be added. Um, so agreement to mediate, is it there? Just yeah. to summarize. And if you're unhappy with the mediator and if something goes wrong and you think mediator is liable for it, can you sue? Are these three questions? Yes. Sanjay? Yes. Rukmani. Yeah, so uh, Sanjay, we, uh, uh, we at camp, we have an agreement to mediate, which is signed by the parties, by the councils and the mediator. So this has all the terms and conditions of how the process is uh, going to be carried out. And most important in this agreement to mediate is the confidentiality clause. That uh, none will breach the uh, confidentiality. And this is also signed by uh, uh, participants who may not be parties to the dispute. It is also signed by the case manager to the extent the case manager is participating in the mediation, we always have, the, some of the mediators have uh, assistance with them. They also sign the uh, mediation agreement. Uh, so this is, yes, there is an agreement which has to be signed very importantly. Without this agreement being signed, we do not proceed. A mediator does not proceed. Your second question was, if anything goes wrong in between, or can we change uh, a mediator? Uh, yeah. that, that was the question? Yes. 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 For some reason, you know, in uh, somewhere after, say, a few sessions, I'm just giving you an example. Uh, the one party suddenly says, no, 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 I think this particular mediator has uh, some conflict. Right? With, uh, so I am not comfortable uh, proceeding with this mediator. The mediator can recuse herself or himself and the parties can uh, opt to another meet because at camp we have and I'm, I'm talking oh. from camp's point of view uh, 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 so sorry about that so uh, it can recuse himself or herself and the parties can then choose another mediator from the panel of mediators and uh, the third question being can they can a mediator be sued right yes yes yeah normally a media uh, a mediator is cannot be sued. 
the mediator cannot be asked to come to court as a witness that is always a part of the agreement that a mediator is uh, you are unhappy with the mediator at any stage the mediator can recuse the mediator can be changed but the mediator cannot be asked to come as a witness or be sued see a mediation agreement uh, until unless there's some uh, big fraud you are you are alleging some uh, great uh, fraud or suppression or something on the part of the mediator which i have never so far in my experience as a mediator come across i have not even heard senior mediators at camp talk you know uh, speak about circumstances like this got it okay see so, uh, just to add to that the mediation bill provides for you to complain against a mediator to the mediation council of india council. on certain grounds uh, it's not just unhappiness that there's been a misconduct no, your breach confidentiality or the mediator has no, breached the neutrality rule so you, with with yeah. the material information and yes. stuff like no, that no yeah so there are specific grounds on which you can complain to the mediation council council which, which is as gayatri saying a part of the bill which is yet to be enacted i understand okay now i have one more question relating to this whole uh, process uh, of uh, sanjay before you so, sorry to interrupt there before you uh, go on can i just add one thing to what gayatri talked about the yeah process? sure sure is uh, she mentioned it briefly but uh, i think it's very significant that a mediation always as mediators we design the entire mediation process there is no unlike a court or an arbitration to step a to step b and go like that in mediation each and every mediation is designed as per the needs and requirements of the parties that's what it's a flexible process that's what is one of the most unique features of mediation so both parties obviously have to agree because that's what they have uh, both signed up both parties have to agree and yes. you know normally we say start off with joint sessions right so i'm i i'm imagining a, a mediation session where you know the two parties are involved maybe more uh, there's a mediator who's sort of uh, kind of getting them to see a common point of view where each of the parties has their lawyers on call they're taking advice etc cetera, etc cetera, all that's going on and after each session after each progress is uh, you know the some progress is made are these meetings all minuted and everybody would you make sure that folks are on the same page or is it like you know you have we sign off something and at the end there's just one agreement sanjay mediation uh, as mediators we do take notes you know but mediation being a extremely confidential process we tell the parties nothing is recorded oh, nothing yeah. even if the no whatever notes are we going to this is for you know uh, a uh, while discussions reminding the parties that at this point of time you did you did mention about this but we never ever uh, to ensure the confidentiality is maintained we never ever rely on uh, even on our crack we've got a crack platform everything is expunged from the platform once a mediation is over understand and my last question relating to this particular topic of uh, mediation in the case of lawyers there is a contingency fee there is a success fee you know things of that nature how does the fee structure work for uh, mediation is it like you know only when i get a settlement is payment to be made or is there some other mechanism rukmani i'll come in here uh, uh, so we uh, in in real life mediation is an early payment uh, normally you are charged for the hour uh, by the hour and uh, it ranges uh, could range between say 10000 to several lakhs depending upon uh, who the mediator is uh, but uh, in camp we have mean several lakhs per hour oh uh, yes several lakhs per hour if you if you got let's say a mediator from us uh, if you had a cross border mediation and you wanted a mediator from us along with the indian mediator and if you have the ambani uh, brothers involved yes and if you have the ambani brothers or reliance and uh, amazon in bot <laughs> so but uh, or given if you have or gayatri even if you have somebody like mr shriram panchu yes yes so you you they see the uh, the point is that um, uh, it's a combination of things you know many times uh, buyers feel that if they get something at a very affordable fee that it is cheap service right it, it's a it's also a marketing dilemma but at camp we have a, a mission to be affordable and accessible dispute resolution process so ours is extremely affordable 
and we have made it more affordable for Thai and which is up on your website and up on our website. And when they come and talk to us, we'll, they will go back thinking and I hope they don't go back thinking they're getting cheap service. Yeah, no, no, I, I think it's, and it's an important point and, and that's yes. the reason I asked because the yes. audience is essentially entrepreneurs yeah. uh, who are aspiring uh, to become the next uh, Ambani or Adani or whoever. And, yes. uh, you know, so one has to be... See, uh, we, we, are, we are entrepreneurs in camp who are not aspiring at all to be Ambani's and Adani's. But You're only aspiring make, for them. Uh. No, uh, only make an impact on uh, justice being accessible. So pure, pure, fully empathetic to their needs. So, Sanjay, if, yeah. if I may jump in, I, I feel yes, you the may. cost of, of this mediation is to be compared against the cost of conflict escalation. Uh, these lacks, even per hour, like we spend, have nothing in comparison to the destruction of value in the billions. Right. So I feel right. my recommendation to entrepreneurs is, you know, the faster and the quicker you address this, uh, this all comes later, right? On hindsight, you wish you had mediated a conflict. But so Abhi, I, uh, Abhi yeah. and lack is never going to be part of camp system. Just, <laughs> just, just to put people's mind at rest. Yeah. <laughs> because the moment... Uh, the, mo the moment they heard you, Abhishek, you know, I think the numbers dropped to 56. Number of participants. <laughs> <laughs> because for, many, for many of them, the lakhs would be the revenues. <laughs> yeah. no, yes, I mean, I mean, Sorry, I, I, I know people have said enough about it, but I really want to put things in perspective. Like, like Abhishek was saying, I'll give you an example of what an arbitrator would cost, what a lawyer yeah. would, uh, would... This would is an important cost. point, yes. Because you really need to compare the costs of dispute resolution. You need to compare like for like. If you can both sit across a table, solve the dispute at no cost to each other, you would do it, right? No one is coming to mediation the minute something is wrong. You only go with that breakdown of communication happens. I mean, when you're left with no other option, a mediator builds that bridge again. It's the cost of building that bridge. So it's as good as the cost of building the company, if you're looking at it, especially from a startup dispute, when you have two founders who've fallen apart, you can either throw dirty laundry at each other, write terrible articles about each other, go to the NCLT and allege oppression, mismanagement, etc. So the value of the company, which is in a few crores, comes down to a few lakhs. Or you can engage a person to get it back to those, you know, tens or 20 crores, etc. Even for a small startup valuation that you're looking for. That, compare that with the cost of arbitration. An arbitrator will not charge you anywhere less than maybe three or four lakhs, even if it's a very simple dispute. Three or four lakhs across the dispute range. A mediator will probably take about five or six sessions. A five or six sessions is, you know, it's a difficult session when you're going through it. Five or six sessions, even if you're paying one lakh per session, that's six lakhs for the mediator, even if you take one lakh. The cost of the arbitrator, the lawyers is going to be approximately the same. Whereas in an arbitration, while you're paying maybe five, six lakhs to the arbitrator, the cost of your legal representatives is approximately 20 or 25 lakhs. So the cost of actual dispute resolution is five lakhs for the arbitrator, about 20, 25 lakhs for your legal counsel. The time that you have spent, the effort that you have put in to get in, get it done in a year and a half, two years. So really people need to think about what exactly those lacks mean. And I truly genuinely believe that mediators should be paid well because that's when they will actually feel motivated. I understand the public spirited nature of it, which is driving the movement here now. But tomorrow when we have the mediation bill and everything becomes compulsory, I think we really need to start monetizing it and telling people this is valuable enough. So please pay them. Absolutely. I, 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 end I endorse that, you know, and God we trust rest <laughs> rest strictly cash. Um, <laughs> So Abhishek, you know, given your experience of dealing with different kinds of conflicts, particularly as it relates to entrepreneurs, what would your ad advice be to entrepreneurs? Uh, you know, because like I said, uh, shareholder agreements, term sheets don't have mediation or arbitration mentioned there, right? It's usually some high court in some uh, city, some place. Um, what would you advise entrepreneurs? Yeah, so I, I touched upon it earlier, Sanjay. There's no reason they shouldn't have mediation clauses. So start there. Look, I think this is a lot about facilitating the conversation around dispute resolution. So if you even insert a clause, it starts the conversation around how we expect to resolve disputes. So I would say something tangible as put a mediation clause in so that at least people know we're going to resolve conflict in disputes in an amicable manner, at least that's the intent. Um, second, I would almost say extend it beyond shareholder agreements, term sheets in every single contractual arrangement, whether it's a vendor, an employee, sign a mediation charter saying this, 
look, have the conversation with young employees saying disputes are inevitable, conflict is inevitable. The reason we, we have a mediation as, a, as an option is because these are the benefits. And I think the moment you facilitate that open-minded conversation, you're halfway there to selling mediation as a, as a, as a solution for dispute resolution. God, which means uh, that, you know, it's critical, therefore, for all parties, the investors, the entrepreneurs, and anyone else at the table, that is the lawyers representing all parties, need to consciously insert these clauses so that Correct. right from day zero, it's there in everyone's consciousness that in the event of some kind of conflict, we are able to go through a process of mediation, Correct. maybe some arbitration, and you know, and finally suing each other is the last kind of option. Yeah. And right? even, even when you onboard employees, make it make it tangible, saying this is how we resolve conflict at our company. Right. Right. Facilitate just, the coordination. Uh, uh, right. Sanjay and Abhishek, just to come here, can we do a dispute resolution planning with the spectrum in mind? Right. So enable the, the organization to be able to exercise options rather than have only one go to option. And we also uh, give out and help you with mediation clauses with this spectrum in mind. And we don't charge for that. Um, so can I ask you, Sanjay, and maybe as proxy to Madan and Abhishek, maybe after this, maybe next month, to do a mediation pledge with a few investors. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, so that'll be, certainly. That'll be a great uh, next step to this yeah. conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. listening to the my co panelists, I'm more and more convinced that mediation is is something that the time is. And you know, uh, Sanjay, I don't think this is an option for too much longer. It's imminent. You know, where as you as entrepreneurs start scaling their businesses, dealing with more sophisticated partners around the world, I believe mediation is going to be upon them for dispute Excellent. resolution. So get ahead of the curve. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we've got some questions coming in from the audience as well. We'll get to them in a minute. Uh, before that, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, let's conduct a poll right now. Um, Vinay. Over to you. We'll conduct a poll now just to see that if our conversation has had any impact on the audience. Yes. So you can see another four question poll. So just scroll down so people know that there are four questions. Yeah, so all of you will find the scroll below. So you have the first question is, uh, now you're more likely to try mediation and litigation to resolve your disputes. Second question, do you have a potential dispute in mind which would be better suited for mediation than litigation? Then we have a question on, would you like to get in touch to know more about mediation? So if yes, please uh, drop in your name, email, phone number in the chat box or with the Thai team. Uh, we will uh, you know, coordinate with uh, camp and get back to you. And the fourth question, as you scroll down, you will find, uh, so would you like to petition to the parliament to fast track the mediation bill? I see 20 of you have already taken the 30 seconds. Yes, I see Soro has asked question. Yeah, we will put it across in the Google form as well, post the event, and we'll send it to uh, the participants, the current participants, as well as those who may have registered and not made it. Okay. So are we done, Vinay? Yes. On that, so excellent. All right, okay. So mediation, yeah. So it seems like hundred percent of all responders have said yes. They would go for mediation. Good. That's the good news. All right, great. And so you know, let's do one thing now with regard to uh, going to the questions that have been asked by um, the audience members. Uh, what I will do is just before we wrap up and get to the audience questions, if you can very really quickly summarize for us, you know, some of the key takeaways. If I have to walk away from this session buzzing about mediation and arbitration, what are those three, four things I need to have in my mind? Okay, Abhishek, would you start? So the three, four takeaways, uh, Sanjay, what's the question? Yes, that's right. Um, why, I, I'm curious about the second answer, why people said that if they had a potential dispute, they wouldn't consider litigation. So my three, four takeaways are uh, facilitate the conversation or dispute resolution early. 
um, before even conflicts arise. Um, second, have the tools of how in an organization. So make sure like organizations like CAMP or make sure uh, participants in contracts understand how to resolve conflict. So it's just not theoretical that mediation is an option. This is how it actually works. Um, and third, please, please weigh the cost against other available dispute resolutions and the cost of time and equity value destruction. Um, and fourth, uh, don't avoid conflict. I think that would be my takeaways. Okay, good. Anyone wants to add to that? I would just like to add one thing. See, very importantly, our mediation bill, I think both Gayatri and Vikas had mentioned about the mediation bill. Now it's high time that the business community, the startup community realizes that once the um, bill is in place, it's enacted. Ma mediation, uh, if they know about mediation, the process of mediation, they should take advantage of this process and get it built into their system well in time when the bill is there because mediation is going to be, uh, it's going to be mandatory once the uh, act comes in. So they should have everything in place so that they're not taken by surprise. And they will go with the flow and sort of not be uh, looking here and there, what is this process about? So that's something extremely important for the business community to have everything in place well in time. Understand, okay. So there's a question that's coming from um, Anish Anand. Uh, the question is, in the eventuality of one party not having legal counsel for whatever reasons, uh, does the mediation uh, counsel offer legal advice as well so that you know one can get to an amicable solution sooner than later? I'd yeah. like to take that question. See, right at the onset, we had uh, it had been emphasized, I think, uh, almost by all of us, that as mediators, we are neutrals. We cannot afford to give legal advice. We may be, I mean, you know, I may be a lawyer, but when I'm sitting there, I'm a mediator. Tomorrow, Vikas at the moment is a counsel. He may be a mediator uh, tomorrow. So it, you cannot give advice. You lose your neutrality if you give legal advice. That is why we always emphasize on the importance of parties coming into mediations with their counsels who are well aware of the process of mediation. Understand, all right. Question from uh, Chuck Kanafi from Berlin. Um, from Thai, Germany, it says, how do you, what about cross-border conflicts? For example, you know, a company out here in Bangalore and, you know, another company out in Silicon Valley, how would mediation work in such a situation? Okay. I'll just go with how uh, uh, CAMP does it as a process. But um, see, the, there is, uh, but before that, I think, uh, you know, uh, it would be great if, uh, because augments it with the Singapore Convention. I'll talk about the process that um, the uh, camp has for dealing with cross-border. So you might have investors abroad, uh, you might have uh, business relationships abroad. And so what do you do if you enter into a dispute relation, uh, dispute there? And uh, mediation then has to be the first option because the cost of litigating abroad uh, is about, it's not one, one year's or 10 years salary. It could be like closing your business and going home. So <laughs> you mediation then becomes only the viable option. <clears throat> so we do the same process. We talk to people and CAMP has done cross-border mediations. And we find that uh, you're able to understand each other's uh, needs and interests. And you'll find that the business guy abroad who is not paying you or talking about efficient goods is able to step back and feel that he can give you an opportunity. He can give you time to pay or say that part of the goods I will... Um, uh, get or release a part of the letter of credit. So all of that has been made possible in the mediation process. The process would remain the same, but it is the use of the process which makes it effectively. And we have what is called the Singapore International Mediation Center and CAMP Protocol, which is first of its kind uh, globally. And uh, we put it in place in COVID because we wanted to provide really fast track mediation resolution, but it continues. So Singapore and us, we come with mediators who also are culturally and nationally, geographically appropriate. So if you have an African, um, uh, you have a dispute, you have, you're making a road or you're supplying something or you're building a PPP infrastructure, then we will bring in mediators who may be appropriate for that dispute along with Indian mediators. 
or you have a family dispute, a divorce case or a separation case or a probate or a will case, and it has both sides of the corridor and we can make that happen for you. So you will find it on our website under what is called SIMC CAMP protocol. But it'll be nice for Vikas to just add a little bit about Kiel Singapore Convention, Sanjay, if it's over, if it's okay with you. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, uh, thanks, Gayatri. Um, so the Singapore Mediation Convention, very simply put, is meant to encourage cross-border mediation and to make mediation settlements that are entered into in cross-border transactions enforceable. Unfortunately, the Singapore Mediation Convention has not yet become as robust as we would like it to be. So if today, for instance, there is a Singapore Mediation Convention country where you enter into a mediation agreement, it's not automatically enforceable in India. So as of today, in international cross-border disputes, if you have a mediation, you need to do a little bit more. I talked about conciliation in India. What you may need to do in a cross-border situation is get that as a consent award in an arbitration context because then it will become enforceable across 100 56 162 countries across the world. So there are ways and means of overcoming these limitations. Hopefully in the next five, 10 years, you don't have to do this, but today you need to. Understand. Okay. Uh, you know, Ajit Singh has uh, made an interesting point, says on the inclusion of mediation or arbitration clause in employment contracts, Industrial Disputes Act provides for conciliation. And both options are available to a uh, workman or a lead employee uh, under the Industrial Disputes Act. True, false, right, but what's your view, Vikas? Sorry, that's maybe, a very complicated question. May, uh, maybe, because, but not quite. Huh? <laughs> no, 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 because a number of things which you used interchangeably are not interchangeable. A workman is not an employee, an industrial dispute is not an employment dispute. So they're very, very different frameworks. And the conciliation under the Industrial Disputes Act is not at all the conciliation that we've been talking about. So a very Simply put, if it is a dispute between a protected employee, protected, I mean, statutorily protected, like a factory worker, that's a workman, you cannot adopt private mediation to resolve those disputes. There is a statutory body called the Industrial Disputes Court, the tribunals, the commissioners appointed there, who will conciliate and try and settle the dispute. That's a statutory mechanism. But when it comes to employee disputes, and I'm talking here about, let's say, senior CXO, CFO employees, or in the private sector where there are employees who are not governed by any special statute, you can have mediation as part and parcel. You can have arbitration as part and parcel of those contracts, but they're very different regimes altogether. Got it. So that was helpful because I think whoever... Um, and, you know, while Ajit Singh asked that question, I'm sure there are others who would be perhaps uh, under the same set of uh, misconceptions. So th thanks, Vikas, for clarifying that. A question now for uh, Abhi from uh, Tara Olapale, who says, what do you see as the value of a professional mediation service? So I think you answered that. Maybe you can answer it differently now. No, I, I think the, the short answer is, you know, let me, I'm, I'm an, I've been an athlete all my life. So I'll use that analogy. Would you rather get trained by an amateur or a professional coach? Uh, you know, like I said, when I reflect, I was a mediator, but I probably wasn't the best mediator. I was doing it based on intuition. So go to the professionals who know what skills uh, will facilitate dispute resolution more efficiently, when to talk, when to stay quiet. Um, you know, I think India is in this wave of professionalization, Sanjay, and everything we do entrepreneurially. So why not even professionalize dispute resolution? Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's a, that's a, yeah, I think that's a wonderful point. A very, very valid and something that we can all take to heart. And uh, so on that note... Sorry, okay, Sanjay, because, yes. you just one final thing. I, I know Rukmini and Gayatri are too modest to say it themselves. So I will say it on their behalf. Mediators who are professionals actually go through a lot of rigorous training to get to where they are. It's not simply that they call themselves professionals because, you know, that's just a cooler way to call them. There are skills that they need to acquire, skills of listening, skills of empathy, skills of communication, which are not something I as a lawyer may have inherently or as a person who may have inherently or board members or investors may have. And I think when it comes to a point of a dispute, you've gone through those barriers where normal modes of communication, normal modes of getting information are all past. You're not going to get anything <coughs> with those channels. So you need someone who's, who's a magician in that trade to actually work some magic to get people on the table, to get them to talk, which trust me is the most difficult because once they get talking, it's easy. But that initial barrier that people have to cross, unless you're trained, it will be very, very hard to do. 
Right. Thank you very much, Vikas. That was very, very helpful. And I think on that note, um, I think we've, uh, we can end this particular session. Certainly not the last one that we will have on mediation, arbitration, and all the other very important stuff that we talked of today, particularly as India formalizes its uh, economy and its businesses and working styles and working processes. Um, it's very important that all of these also get uh, become part and parcel of the toolkit of uh, every single company, especially entrepreneurial ones who don't pay much attention or in fact any attention uh, to processes and compliance and, the, and don't pay attention to any of these until it becomes too late. So um, thank you, Gayatri. Thank you, Vikas, Avi and Rukmini for your time, for your wisdom, for your insights and experience sharing. Um, and thank you all to all the participants. And uh, thank you uh, for asking all those questions. If you get to the uh, Camp Med uh, site, there is a YouTube video that will be uploaded there where you can watch all of this. Any questions, concerns, comments, et cetera, please mail us and we'll be, uh, we will be able to get back to you with our responses and we will make sure that uh, Camp is well and truly part of this entire Thai Bangalore Camp Mediation Desk and adding value to the entire ecosystem. Thank you all very, very